Hey, good morning, Shabbat Shalom. So you don't need me to tell you how bad things are. And you don't need me to tell you how difficult things are. And you don't need me to feed your anger, to feed your fears. What I think you need me for, and all of us here, is to remind ourselves how much good there actually is and how great it still is to be Jewish and how much we have to offer. It feels dark and it feels bad in a lot of ways and it feels in some ways the world is against us, but the world is not against us. There are some people who are but the world isn't. And I think we need to pull back and remind ourselves that there is still so much good that is going on and so much good that we can do because otherwise we are just going to rot from the inside out and we won't even have noticed it. Judaism has so much to say about giving the best of what you have in the worst of times. When things are the most challenging, when things feel lost, when things feel chaotic, when you don't have the ground firm beneath you, Judaism says, we have so much to give, each one of us. And that in that giving, it's a recognition that other people have gifts as well, and that we don't have to give in to the hate and to the anger and to the fear. Because when we do, the other people win. When we get as angry and as hateful as the enemy, the enemy wins. Because that spirit carries on. I am not naive. Right? I am the child of a Holocaust survivor. <laughs> I never met most of my family. I can't even do a family tree. I know that there has been evil in the world, but I know that so much of it isn't, and I am not giving into it. In our Torah portion today, it takes place in the wilderness. The people had been slaves for hundreds of years, and they're brought into the Midbar, and they had done nothing for themselves for hundreds of years. They did everything for Pharaoh. Everything they built, everything they created was because they were ordered under pain of death to do so. And there was almost nothing left of them spiritually or emotionally. But there was enough. There was something there. And that's what the tabernacle was about, the Mishkan. God tells Moses to tell the people, Daber el bene Israel viachuli truma me eight kol isha sheri yidvenu li bauti chu et trumati, that tell each of the people to bring gifts from every single person whose heart volunteers. So there's a piece of psychology here. It's not that God is ordering them, God is saying from the fullness of their heart, because you can only give of yourself if you have something, if you feel whole, if you feel human. And God is reminding them. And the gifts are Zahav, Kesef, and Nechoshet, gold, silver, and copper, different yarns, linen, uh, uh, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices, incense, Avne Shoham, Ve'az, Avne Miluim. Lapis lazuli and other beautiful stones that would be part of the uh, the aphod, the uh, the breast piece for the kohen. Whatever you got, whether you have gold or whether you just have acacia wood is like balsa. It's a very uh, very lightweight, cheap wood. Whatever you got to give, God will consider all of it as a hundred percent of an offering, and all of that together is vasuli mikdash b'shachanti b'tocham, that when we bring our gifts, then we've created the sanctuary for God to feel like God can live there. 
And I think the setting of this is important. They came out of Egypt with these things is in a way the Egyptians sort of paid them for their, uh, for their labor over the centuries. But that's all they had. It's not like there was a lapis lazuli store in the wilderness or that there was a jewelry shop where they could get more. On the surface, it sounds like God is asking for everything that they have and is just taking. But what they realized is that the entire point of the gifts was that their giving of them made them whole, made them feel human. It, they gave what they had, but what they got in return was a community they got a sense of purpose, they felt valued. We know that one of the biggest causes of sadness in people who are isolated is they don't feel needed. They don't feel seen. And God is saying here, I see you and I value you. God could have been the God of Egypt Right? They, were, they were wealthy, they were powerful, they had everything. God could have asked them for gifts. But God looked at a people who felt hollow and who felt empty and said, I see you, you are perfect the way you are, and I will take all of your gifts. And God asked them to build a place of holiness. They're not building weapons. They're not going back to Egypt and looking for vengeance on the Egyptians. They're looking to go forward with their lives. They're willing to go forward and see what this new world will bring for them. Building is what heals your heart and soul, not destroying the other. The danger they faced was real, right? They're alone in the wilderness. There were a lot of bad people in the wilderness. The danger was real, but they were better equipped to handle it because God said you are capable of creating something beautiful. You are capable of creating something that the world needs. And the Jewish approach to tragedy is to build up what is beautiful, to affirm our values, and to live meaningfully Jewish lives. It is not to obsess on destroying our enemy. We have to protect ourselves. Right? There is no question. We need to be strong. We need to protect ourselves physically, spiritually, and emotionally. There are people in the world who mean us harm. But if that is all we focus on, we are not going to do well. The rabbis who created the Talmud lived during the Roman period, which was a time of tremendous danger and persecution and anti-Semitism. But what the rabbis said we have to do is build up our schools, build up our synagogues, build up our homes. And the Roman Empire itself is gone. They ultimately destroy themselves because their hatred of the other, their need to control the other, eventually they destroyed each other. I believe that ultimately our enemies will destroy themselves again, as every one of our enemies has throughout history. Again, we have to defend ourselves. We have to be smart. Again, I'm not naive about the dangers, but if our purpose in life is to destroy our enemies, we will ultimately destroy ourselves. We must never lose our sense of values, our sense of compassion, our demand for justice for everybody. So I try to think about what should we be doing then as a Jewish community, as a Dat Shalom, as individuals. Say so the first is to claim your inheritance, recognize the gifts that you've been given we have a Torah, we have a Jewish community, we have Jewish learning, we have schools, we have institutions, we have a history. It's all yours. It's, it's there. You already have it. I think sometimes we just forget about how important that is or how amazing it is to have this community that has been around for thousands of years it's not an accident. It's because we live by what matters and not wasting our time on things that don't matter. And I think we have to help other people find their gifts as well. There's so many people have a lot to give, but they don't know where. And I don't mean just financially, though we'll, we'll take it. 
your time, your talents, your thoughts. No one here is expendable. Bring a friend to services. Bring a friend to anything. It might be what your friend needs. I think so often we're afraid to bring people because, oh, they might be bored. You know what's great? Being bored. I love, I love being bored. Love it. Which I'm sure you're all enjoying right now. I have that much awareness. Being bored beats anxiety, <laughs> beats frustration. Bored is actually a lovely thing. You're just sitting there and letting the world kind of wash over you. That's okay. It doesn't all have to be exciting. In fact, exciting is exhausting. Your friend might just need that kind of ocean of calm. You might need it more than you even think. Um, even lighting Shabbat candles seems simple. It sounds ubiquitous. You know, you, you, you do it every week. But what power in that idea of after everything we went through during the week, we're going to say that the light still matters. There are lots of simple things that we can do. Buy from businesses that do business in, with Israel, from Israeli businesses, from Jewish businesses, um, from people who have just been supportive of the Jewish community and not hateful. There are a lot of them out there. The world, again, doesn't hate us. There are people in the world who do, but the world does not. And there are a lot of people who actually really do care. Um, let politicians know what you think. I think that act, political activism does a lot more than these than a lot of other things. Call your politicians. Call people you'd like to be your politician. Uh, and also let Israeli politicians know what you think, too. Don't tell them what to do, but you can tell them what you think and what matters, and that there are voices out here that care and that we very much want to see a society that is truly safe and truly just for everybody. Um, we have so many gifts. Again, don't waste them on hate and anger. Use them in the way that the Torah demands to build, to create spaces of holiness and love and figure out what you're best at and use that energy and enthusiasm to create the entire world as a home worthy of God's presence. God says, Vasuli Mikdash Vishachanti Petocham, when you make me a sanctuary, when you make the world into a place worthy of God's presence, then God will live among all of us. Shabbat Shalom.